Aragi Kayomi, the protagonist of the Monogatari series, and one Honey Bugger. He was at one point a human, then a vampire, then a half-baked mockery of a human, then was back to being a vampire again, and then died, got sent to hell, was resurrected as a human, and then became a mockery of a human once more. Basically, the point is, Aragi Kayomi is someone who is deeply entwined in the world of oddities. If you find yourself entertained at any point during the video, then consider liking, subscribing, and ringing that bell, as I cannot explain to you how much such a small action can do for this channel. Also, if you want to support this channel even further, then consider pledging to my Patreon. Anyway, on with the video. Before we tackle the analysis of Araki as a character, I first want to analyse his name and design as I think that will lay a groundwork for the rest of the video. To start with his name Araki, this can be split into four kanji, first is A, and although there are several meanings, the one most applicable to Araki is the meaning to panda, as he is both pandered as the centre of the Araki harem and because he is the audience's surrogate. Since Ah can also make up the word Aho, which means fool, this could also reference how idiotic or foolish Aragi can be, which further can link to his hairstyle which is called an Ahoge, or literally idiot hair. The kanji for Ra means good, and well, I don't think I need to explain how this applies to his character. Next is the repeater symbol, which in Japanese means you repeat the last kanji used, in this case Ra again, and fun fact, the way I remember what this symbol means is because it looks a bit like a plasma repeater from Halo. Anyway, repeated kanji act to emphasize the kanji, so the Ra Ra means he isn't just good, he's very good. Lastly is the kanji Yi, which can also be read as Ki, and this means tree. And well, the tree acts a bit like Aragi's signature sign, not only does it reference his own depressed way of saying he wished he was a plant rather than a human, but also references how he turned into a tree in his fight with Glitting Cutter. Also in the Cram School tree, a constant reminder to him of his hellish spring break. The tree at North Shira Heavy Shrine is also of significance to Aragi as it's the first thing he sees when he dies by Gain's hand in hell. The fact Kaiki also has the kanji of a tree in his name is very much to tie into the use of Gi in Araki's name as the two actors foils for one another, and Ononeko's name literally means an axe for a tree, as a reference to how she constantly threatens to kill Araki aka the tree. So as you can see, trees, or plants as a whole, have a lot of relevance to Araki's character and the characters associated with him, which will be mentioned again later in the video. His given name Kaomi though is a lot less complicated and just means calendar. After all, the main saga takes place over one year of his life, with every arc beginning with a mention of what date it is. Calendars also reference the passage of time, aka growing up, which links into how the main saga is a coming of age story for Aragi, which I'll probably explain shortly. And I guess the way that the timeline jumps all over the place can also reference the calendars in reference to time. His physical appearance though is of less note, and that's kind of the point. It is very much that of a standard light novel protagonist, as he is meant to be somewhat of a relatable MC, at least to the target audience of the series, young adults in Japan, specifically those dealing with personal issues. Therefore, his bland appearance makes him easier to relate to. However, he still has a couple key design features. First is his hairstyle, the before mentioned Ahoge, or idiot hair, which will show he can be a bit of an idiot. But this is also somewhat of a niche of Eastern staple, with MCs in his other works and their siblings often being characterised by their Ahoges like Madaka and their siblings in Madaka Box. The most important part of his character design though is the hair that covers one of his eyes. This of course reflects the idea of obfuscation, in simple terms looking through things with one eye and so never getting the full picture and well we'll explain why this is relevant to his character soon enough. Aragi Kaomi is a very flawed character, and the majority of the series is him identifying and overcoming these flaws. Monogatari then acts as a coming of age story as Aragi the protagonist matures into an adult proper by overcoming his personal problems and flaws. Which of course is why Awari Monogatari, the final story, concludes with graduation as it signifies the end of his coming of age story and the age of his maturation, as past this point, in other words past the main part of the story, he is no longer a student or a kid, and so is now an adult who can't blame all his problems on fairy tales and folklore which is why he is more hands on in the monster season when it comes to dealing with oddity related issues as he is now a responsible adult who can deal with stuff himself without constantly asking a specialist or an oddity to fix all his problems. Shown by how Gaian agrees to leave him alone in the first part of the monster season, Shinobi Monogatari, and how most of the parts tie directly into the idea of growing up and maturing, showing that the idea of coming of age is the main theme of the main saga to carry on into the monster season which indicates its overall significance to Monogatari as a series. But since I imagine most of you haven't read any of the monster season, let's leave it at that and begin to explore each of Aragi's flaws one by one, so we can get a full picture and a full understanding of his character. This is the flawed logic that Aragi believed due to a certain incident in his first year at high school. Of course, this is the incident involving Okira Sadachi, the case of who was the culprit in the math score scandal. Okira was innocent, Aragi knew that, he was confident enough to declare it as fact. 
But even so, when the class came to vote, the one they decided to blame was her. The person who 100% didn't do it. Araki, due to the household he was brought up in with two police officer parents, had a pretty solid belief in righteousness. He believed that things were right and things were wrong. It was just up to people to decide whether they could do the right thing or not. However, in this incident, when an innocent person was condemned, where the wrong choice was made without question, he learned a very harsh truth. He learned that the right thing, that righteousness, can be infinitely produced. That if enough people decide it is right, then it is right. That the key factor to righteousness is numbers, it is a majority rule. Having friends, not just interacting with people, was just a means to an end, a means to determining what is right, and even further, that those who should be righteous, like his teacher, don't have to be. Just because your role is to be good, that doesn't mean you will be. That is a fact that Aragi was genuinely terrified of, so he chose solitude over establishment. If he was alone, then the cruelty of an artificial righteousness would not be something he would ever have to face. Aragi was fully aware that this was the reason he chose solitude, but even so he convinced himself that it wasn't just fear. He wasn't just scared and traumatised by that event in that classroom, he had other reasons as well. Other reasons for why solitude is best. If he had friends and they got hurt, he would be hurt. If they got sad, he would also be sad. It may seem unrelated, but it goes back to the same singular idea that scared Aragi, the majority rules. If the people around him feel hurt, then the consensus feeling is hurt. If the majority of people are sad, then he will be sad as well. Short as Hanukkah points out, the reverse is also true. If your friends are happy, you are too. But the mere fact that emotions, much like righteousness, can be dictated by this idea of a majority, is what still scares Aragi. As that is all it is, childish fear. Aragi is just scared. He's scared of making friends. His mindset is the kind of thinking one uses to protect themselves from possible unpleasantries at the cost of all happiness. As he is ruled by fear, he doesn't want friends as he's too scared of what happens next. This here is the first of Aragi's many flaws, and is the one that is mainly addressed, and to an extent resolved, throughout just two parts, those being Bakimonogatari and Kizumonogatari. As in Kizumonogatari, he makes a friend, and in Bakimonogatari, he makes four more. The five Bakke girls are his friends. Hanikawa is the first of these new connections Aragi forms. She basically forces her way in and makes herself his friend all on her own. And the fact she has to go to such lengths is a testament to how resolute to his flawed mindset Aragi was. But by the end of Kizumonogatari, it is clear how much Aragi cherishes his and her friendship. Sure, his statement that having friends makes you lose your intensity as a human is proven correct when he has to literally throw away his humanity to save her from Gillette Cutter. But then it is due to her friendship that he doesn't give in to being a monster and fights back to regain his humanity. Friendship is what saved Aragi in Kizumonogatari, and that is why Aragi is so intent on calling Hanikawa his saviour. But as we know, you can't save anyone, you can only save yourself all on your own, and well, that is of course true. As it isn't Hanikawa that saves him, no, he saves himself by allowing himself to accept her friendship. He changes his ways on his own and overcomes his flaws on his own, and then saves himself all on his own. And in case you weren't aware, this journey of his in relation to friendship is symbolically shown throughout Keys and the Lottery, with three key scenes, all involving panties. First, he sees Hanikawa's panties by accident. As their meeting was an accident, he enjoyed seeing them, but then denied ever seeing them. This is symbolic of their friendship. He enjoyed talking to her, but like how he was too scared to say he saw her panties, he was too scared to be her friend. Next, she shows him her panties when asked. This time, their meeting isn't by accident, and Aragi, by verbally asking, is just making an advance himself. He is moving forwards with their relationship himself, but since he is still just looking, it shows he hasn't committed to giving up his life of solitude. And then lastly, Hanakawa gives him her panties. This then shows their friendship as complete. By physically taking the panties, Aragi can no longer be called someone standing at the far. Before by asking, he showed interest in friendship, but only watched it from afar. Now he has clutched their friendship with his own two hands, and since he goes on to cherish these panties as a family heirloom, this is symbolic of how he cherishes their friendship going forward. Which is also why when she takes them back in Masubi Monogatari, it is symbolic of the distance that grew between them. But anyway, panty symbolism aside, Hanikawa is without a doubt Aragi's saviour, as she was the one to show him that being happy when your friends are happy far outweighs being sad when they are sad. I mean, the reason she is so often shown in Kizu Monogatari with a red umbrella is that when viewed from above, she looks like a red circle. And this, of course, is in reference to the Japanese flag, which we see so often over the Keys of Monogatari trilogy. She then is the red circle, the flag, the rising sun, and what is the weakness of a vampire? The sun. So Hanikawa representing the sun is the natural enemy of Aragi's vampirism, and with her influence, her friendship, his humanity can be restored, and his vampirism can be destroyed. She was his first friend since the incident with Okura, and it's thanks to her that he goes on to make so many more. 
Look at his face here when he's talking about friends. And look at it here when Senjukahara asks to be his friend. It's night and day. Connection with others is what Aragi was sorely missing. When he became a vampire, he lost his humanity. He literally lost all his power as a human. He became alone with no one but Kishot by his side. However, the fact he wanted to go back to being human shows just one thing. He may be scared, but he doesn't actually want to be alone. And so he fought tooth and nail to regain his humanity so that he wouldn't be alone. As friendship doesn't decrease your intensity as a human, no, it increases it. It increases it enough to turn a full blood monster into a mockery of a human. Aragi, quite frankly, doesn't place nearly enough worth in his own life. As the saying goes, those who are most likely to jump in and try to save someone can do so because they don't place any value in their own life. The most obvious example of this in the series is of course Aragi's first meeting with Kishot. He didn't have any reason to save her. She wasn't even human, but even so he gave up his life so she could survive. As revealed later on Kingdom Monogatari, in the back of his mind, Aragi knew that Kishot was a man-eating monster and he subconsciously knew that by saving her, he was unleashing such a demon onto Japan. However, his need to make his life have some worth superseded all this. If his death allowed someone to survive, then it meant his life was enough to save another life. Essentially, it meant his life was actually worth the same as everyone else's. In his mind then, to prove his life was worth the same as everyone else's, he had to give it up in exchange for someone else's life. However, it goes a layer deeper, as although sure having his life be worth the same as everyone else's is great, he wants more. Despite being an altruist, Aragi only goes to save Kishrod after she asks him for help. He doesn't want to save just anyone, he wants to save the weak and the vulnerable, as it makes him seem like some kind of hero, someone of more worth than your average person. Which is as Kishrod says at the end of Kizu Monogatari, where Aragi doesn't want to save her once she has her power back, as she is no longer vulnerable and in need of saving. To be so lacking in self-worth that you feel only by dying you can prove your worth is something incredibly sad. However, that is how Aragi felt because as discussed already, he isolated himself from everybody else. He thought that no one would miss him, and to an extent that's true, apart from his family, who would? But that's missing the point, as the only reason this is the case is because he ran away from friendship and connection out of fear. He has no friends to remember him, no big achievements to go down in history, and this is all down to his own fear. As already said, one of the reasons he tries to save people is because he's trying to prove himself. He doesn't want to be worthless, but the only way he knows to try to rectify his self-inflicted issues is to try to throw himself at the problem in a self-sacrificial manner. The overall issue then is that Aragi is half-assed. In Kizu Monogatari, he says he wants to be a plant. This may sound like he has given up, but that's not the case. A plant is still living. If he had really had no faith in himself and really didn't care about his life, then wouldn't he instead wish to be a rock or some other inanimate object? The fact he wishes to be a plant shows he has at least a little drive left. He may be depressed and alone, to the point he wants to be something that can't move or think, but at least he still wants to be alive. He wallows in his own self-pity, sure, but in some moments he does try to prove himself. So how does he come to resolve this lack of any self-worth? Of course connection helped. If he had people that cared for him, then that proved to an extent that his life was worth something. But the bigger reason in my eyes is Shinobu. Oshino Shinobu is someone just like him. They are both worthless, both not quite human and not quite oddity. However, even so, she's still proud. She may have lost most of her vampiric abilities and be stuck in a child's body, but she still is proud to be the oddity slayer. And more importantly is that the two of them are linked. If one of them dies, so does the other. The link is the physical representation to Aragi of his life's worth. His life and Shinobu's are tied. They are worth exactly the same. If something happens to one of them, it will also happen to the other. Aragi being a maths nerd is someone who has always cared about numbers. He was scared of the idea of a majority rule. He quantified his humanity as increasing or decreasing and he tried to value his life against his shots. Therefore, to have a physical representation of a life equal to his own must solidify to Araki that his life is worth something. And this is of course taken even further in Ogi Dark, where he risks his own life to save his own life. Proving that he no longer needs to compare another life to his own and that he can confidently say that his own life is worth saving and that his life has worth. If there is one thing that links every arc of Bakim on the Gottery together, is that in each of them, Aragi sticks his neck where it doesn't belong. And although in most cases this does lead to a positive ending, it's never due to Aragi saving them. As well, you can't ever save someone, you can only save yourself all on your own. Aragi tries to be a hero, he tries to save people even when you can never save anyone. And why is that? It's because he's naturally an altruist, someone who wants to help others, but as you may have already sussed out, it isn't because he's a naturally good person, or at least it isn't that simple. As once more, his desire to save people is another result of his crippling lack of self-esteem and self-worth. 
He doesn't want to be a hero, he wants to be viewed as a hero, as someone great and as someone of great worth. He doesn't try to save people out of selflessness, but out of selfishness, because he wants to feel good about doing it, because he wants to get something out of it. A hero's role doesn't end after the immediate danger subsides, but Araki isn't a hero, he is just someone playing the hero. He may accuse his sisters of just playing the hero, but that's just wrong. Even after Kaiki left town, Karen and Ski still went out to help those suffering from the after effects. And that's what real heroes do. They weren't playing heroes, but he was. He ripped the Jaganera off of Sengoku's body, but he didn't do anything else. Sengoku suffered to the point she turned into a murderous snake god because Aragi got involved with her but never saw anything through. Sure, her obsession with being seen as a victim was also to blame, but Aragi still didn't take responsibility after getting involved. And side note, that is one of the reasons why Aragi was such a bad effect on her life as she is someone who likes to be seen as a victim and he is someone who likes to be seen as a hero. They are both the same, two people who are trying to fill a role in order to make themselves feel better. He saves girls as he wants to be seen as a saviour, he wants to be their prince, to be an object of their affection, so that he feels worthwhile. However, he isn't a hero, he doesn't do any of the heavy lifting after the fact, and in multiple cases gives the girls false hope. They try to rely on him, but he can't actually take their burden, and so fails to be the hero he acts like. Another aspect to this hero side of his, as I briefly mentioned, is that he only saves girls, and so logically he never saves any boys. In fact, think about how few male characters are even in the story. Oshino is his mentor, but the rest are all rivals or villains. Kaiki is the most obvious example of this. In Aragi's eyes, he is pure evil, a comically evil villain in opposition to him, the hero. And why is this? Well, because in Aragi's eyes, he's a rival, a rival for Senjikahara's feelings. He doesn't have any male friends, as he would just see them as a rival. He hates Kaiki to an almost unusual degree, and that's because he has a past of Senjikahara. The same is true for Seishiro, a character who, if they were female, would surely be someone Aragi stick their neck out to save. But he's male, even if he's a victim in need of a helping hand, even if he's remarkably similar in aspects of the series heroines, he is seen as nothing but a rival and a villain by Aragi. Aragi may say there is no such thing as the Aragi harem, but I'm sure inside he is overjoyed by such a group, as it's a group of weak girls who need saving from him a hero, once again in service to his lack of self-worth and desire to feel worthy. His self-loathing is also the reason he is so eager to put himself in danger. He is aware of his own hypocrisy and his own faults to an extent, but instead of working to resolve them, he instead seeks self-punishment. He throws himself into danger, he lets his bones break, his limbs be severed and his organs spill out. Not only does this make him seem even more heroic, boosting his ego and nursing his lack of self-worth, but it also allows him to punish himself. I don't think I need to tell you that this isn't healthy behaviour. In the same way Sengoku victimises herself to the point she starts to become unsympathetic, Aragi is so self-hating and so self-loathing, it becomes self-obsession. He is so self-absorbed that he harms himself. It's not really a matter of anyone else, it's all about him. He knows he isn't a hero and knows he can't see things through, so when things get messy, all he can do is ask someone else for help. I mean, just think back to the end of Kizu Monogatari. All Kishot wanted was a prince, someone to come and save her, the princess, but he isn't a prince, even if he would like to be, so he doesn't resolve the issue himself, even after resolving to end it himself. Instead, he asks Oshino for help and requests an unreasonable answer that ties up all loose ends and leaves no mess. However, Oshino sees the world properly and calls out his delusions. He takes the easy route out and makes everyone suffer instead of saving anyone, as he is unable to save people and he is fine with suffering himself. Though don't get me wrong, Aragi isn't a bad person for not being able to save people, as you can't ever save anyone. The issue is that he acts like a hero and then when he can't do it, he either takes the easy way out or pushes the problem onto someone else. He knows this is bad and knows he is hypocritical, but he never addresses the problem instead, punishing himself with more stupid self-sacrificing displays. He saves people and hurts himself because once again, he is self-obsessed. He knows he has flaws but refuses to address or identify them in favour of taking the easy way out and hurting himself. So how does he come to resolve this issue? The issue of him refusing to resolve his issues? Well, it all comes down to the moment he risked his body and inflicted pain on himself, not in order to save someone else, and not in order to punish himself, but in order to save himself. Araki sees the world in black and white. It takes Oshino spelling it out for him in the most heinous of examples in Nekamonogatari Kuro, for him to get the simple message that people are grey. As I already said, he only desires to save weak girls, asking for help. As in his black and white view of the world, there are people who need help and people who don't. And to him, the most stereotypical answer to who needs help is a weak girl. He didn't understand why Sengoku became the way she did, because she wasn't acting how he thought she should. 
She was a timid, quiet girl, so it didn't even compute to him that inside she could be so different. The same can be said for Hanikawa. Due to her personal development, she became a different person to the one Aragi first became friends with, and he was scared by that fact. And so like with most things, instead of taking the difficult solution that actually would end in something worthwhile, he chose a self-harming and violent solution. In Nekamonogatari Kuro, he chose to stick a sword inside him and risk his life to merely postpone the issue of Black Hanikawa rather than take any meaningful action. And then in Nekamonogatari Shiro, he didn't become the hero Hanikawa asked him to be, but instead told her to take personal responsibility. He chose to take the easy way out, as to be honest, he was scared of her. She was just too complex to him. He chose to see her as a saviour and as a god as it was easier for him. If he looked at her not as a person but as something more, then he need not concern himself with the mess of problems she had as a person. He runs in fear and screams when he sees the abuse Hanikawa is put through, but does nothing about it as he doesn't know how. And that on its own is fine. The issue is that he doesn't just admit that. He still wants to be the hero to save people, but due to seeing the world for only black and white terms, he cannot be anything more than a person playing the hero. The world is black and white, things make sense, they fall into categories, they operate as you would expect. By viewing the world this way, Aragi can view his life not as something random, as meaningless, but as something with a specific purpose, something with worth. His life then is like a role in a story, one he just has to follow. If he does this, he will have a purpose, have some worth. And this extends to his friends too, when they act differently to how he thought, it scares him, as they aren't filling some specific role. It makes clear to him that they aren't characters in a story he is telling, no, they are real living and breathing people. They aren't black and white, they are over 50 shades of not just grey, but every colour you can think of. Aragi is oblivious. That may somewhat sound correct, but I think a better way to put it is that Aragi doesn't ever see the full picture. Whether it's by choice or not, he is only ever looking at stuff through one eye, hence why one of his eyes is always covered. In some ways, this is a defence mechanism. He full well knew that Okura was in an abusive household when they met as kids. After all, no one told him that in Ogi formula, it was all down to him to remember it. However, he quite frankly didn't want to do anything about it. He was overwhelmed and so subconsciously chose to ignore the clear signs Okura desperately tried to show him. He chose to see her abusive household through one eye and so completely mistook the situation. I mean, he met her three times during his life, all of which being major moments in his life, but for some reason, he just didn't remember her. Well, that's because he didn't want to. Okira Sadachi was too messy, too outside the realms of black and white, and so he chose to ignore her, as that was the easy way out for him. Aragi, despite having a girlfriend, hangs around with loads of women, two of which have massive crushes on him. And like with most things, Aragi notices and then ignores it. He doesn't want to face it. Doing so would be messy. It's easier to look at things through black and white terms and boil Sengoku down to just a cute girl than to actually reject her and take responsibility. Hanikawa goes to the point of giving birth to oddities, in part due to her crush on Aragi. As well, he doesn't want to address those feelings, and so he doesn't. He hates himself too much to accept them, and is too scared of what will happen once he does reject them. The people he knows will change and become something that doesn't fall in line with his predetermined black and white view of them. So he just chooses to not acknowledge it, and to not see the full picture. He wants to be seen as a fool, hence his Ahoga hairstyle. He wants to be viewed as an idiot who doesn't know anything, so he doesn't have to be responsible for the things he notices, but chooses to ignore. This is why Ogi calls him a fool. It's because she is him and he wants to be seen as a fool. I personally think the overall reason Aragi sees the world like this is due to his desire for righteousness to exist. For good and evil to be a black and white thing opposed to what he was shown in that classroom. He wants life to have a purpose, to be a black and white reality, like words on a page. He wants people to have roles to fill, personality types to conform to. He calls this returning vampirism atonement rather than consequences as he sees life almost like a story, rather fitting for the narrator of our story don't you think? But he isn't special no matter how self-obsessed he is and how much he genuinely believes that. God didn't choose to punish him, because he isn't that special, he is just a normal old high school kid. But he can't accept this. The world is a sloppy one, a messy one. Things aren't ruled by righteousness. Efforts aren't always rewarded and things don't always go your way. Aragi doesn't want to see the world in this way. He wants it to be black and white as that way his life doesn't seem so insignificant. His desire to have self-worth stretches to the point it affects his whole perception of the world. If he is righteous in the black and white world, then he has worth. If he has a role, then he has worth. People who live in the world of oddities aren't normal people. Oddities aren't a force for good. Yet Aragi dives headfirst into this world again and again. And why is that? Because the world of oddities is one of rules. The darkness is a universal rule. Oddities behave in a set way to a set purpose. The black and white world Aragi sees is far closer to the realm of oddities than it is to reality. 
and Aki refuses to see the world the way it is, and that is why facing Ogi is arguably the hardest thing he ever did, as he had to identify her, identify her as him, and by doing so he had to define who Aragi Kayomi really was. Ogi is Araki's darkness, his Gungian shadow, a physical manifestation of all his personal issues that he knows are there but refuses to address. He only sees the world through one eye, so she has two large eyes always staring forward. He reaches out his hands to save people, so her hands are hidden away, unable to reach out to anyone. They are opposites, but at the same time, they are the same. Araki wants to play the hero, but can never take responsibility after the fact. Ogi wants to play the detective, but after the reveal, she feels like she has no more worth. Although this line references how she is him, it also references how she doesn't know anything herself and can't do anything herself as she is bound to her role as Araki's shadow and can never do anything apart from it as she, like him, has a little self-worth. Araki, by identifying Ogi, has him finally acknowledge himself. He can see Ogi's flaws clear as day and so can now see his own flaws. She looked nothing like him as he had a lack of any self-perspective. He ran away from his problems even when he knew they were there. So no wonder he couldn't see himself even when she was standing right in front of him. They play the role of protagonist and antagonist as they live in a world of black and white. Whereas Araki self-punishes himself in response to his flaws, Ogi takes it out on others. She finds people who share the same flaws as her. Think about it, Sengoku was like Aragi in that she is a hypocrite who never faces anything and tries to play a part. So Ogi leads her to the point where normally Aragi would jump in and try to save her, but instead lets her see it through on her own, even if it leads to disastrous consequences. Ogi was bound by her role, her purpose, to the point she laments over it to Skihi. However, she sees the world in a black and white view, so accepts that Aragi must face her to save himself, and that she is fated to disappear. However, by revealing her identity, by outing the lie of her existence and summoning the darkness, Aragi isn't dealing with his issues, no, he's just making them known. In order to resolve them, to move to better himself, he has to do something about it, which he does. He like always throws himself in harm's way to save the girl in need, except this time the girl in need is himself. By risking his own life to save Ogi, he is symbolically saving himself. He may have caused himself harm, losing his arm in the process, and he may have been reckless, but he did so in service of himself. You can only save yourself all on your own, and so on his own, he saves himself. He stops seeing the world through black and white, he sees the full picture and throws himself in the way of danger, not to punish himself, not to take the easy way out, but instead to save himself. If he had let the darkness swallow up Ogi, then that would have been the easy way out. The darkness would swallow her whole and leave no mess. But for once, Aragi doesn't choose the easy way out, nor the way with the least mess. He saves Ogi knowing how messy the result was going to be. It may seem on paper like he just did what he always does, but it is different on so many levels. And the most clear reason for why this is the case is that he earns the praises and respect of Oshino Meme. Oshino is, in a way, the complete opposite of Aragi. He sees things from all angles, understands the grave situations, and never makes out he's a hero or a saviour. The ending of Bakim on the Gottery shows Aragi rising to the occasion in Oshino's absence. And to an extent he succeeds, but it's only with the ending of Awari Monogatari, where Aragi saves himself, that he can truly be acknowledged by Oshino. This moment is so powerful, as it is the payoff to the first part of the entire series, Back in Monogatari. Oshino left the town in Aragi's hand, and now he has finally proven how much he has matured in that time. After all, as I said at the beginning of the video, the main saga of the series is about Aragi growing and coming of age. The final scene of Awari Monogatari shows Aragi running off to save another girl in need. Now this may seem counter to everything I said, and could almost be called a regression of his character, but that is a grave misunderstanding. Aragi being an altruist isn't the problem. Him helping people is a good thing, the issue was that he acted the part of a hero even when he couldn't do anything. Him helping people has never been the issue, the issue was that he tried to save them. You can't save someone else, but you can help them, and Aragi is a good person, going by his name he is a good good person and it's just in his nature to go and help a girl in need. As that is what OG's catchphrase really means, as you can never be anything more than yourself, nothing more and nothing less. And only by accepting and understanding yourself can you move forward. You are only yourself and there's nothing wrong with that. People are a certain way that can't be changed at their core, however what you can do is change the way you act on it. And that's exactly what Aragi now does. He helps people in a different way. A way that still conforms to his altruistic nature, but doesn't put his own well-being at risk. Before, he held people due to his lack of any self-worth, but now having risked his life to save his life, he understands his own worth, and so that is now no longer his motive. 
He just wants to help them as they are in need and he is someone with a righteous heart. He was raised to value righteousness and even if good and bad aren't as binary as he once thought, they still exist. So he drops everything he is doing, he runs for a random girl's aid and he genuinely tries to help her as that's just the kind of man he is. Reason to be damned, if he is helping people, he is helping people. However, despite being called the final story, a wire monogatory isn't the final story, not by a long shot actually. But in terms of the main saga, there is one more part left to discuss, and that is the final story continued, Zoku or Wari Monogatari. This is an arc about Aragi post-saving himself. It's an arc of reflection, as he reflects on his life up until that point, where he expresses his regrets and his misgivings about the past. Now that he can look on it differently without the black and white lenses he relied on before, he's no longer looking at the world through just one eye, hence why he can now see the different sides of people, he can see sides of them he never before could. He can see the side of Sengoku that wasn't just a cute girl, and the side of Karen that wasn't just his annoying sister. He can see Ononoke as a person with emotions and someone with shame, and not just as a tool. He can see Shinobu as the human she once was, and Okura as the friend that could have been. Honestly, I'm quite surprised that in this final arc, Aragi didn't cut off his fringe. Not only would this physically make it so that he can now see through both eyes, having his usually hidden eye uncovered, but also line up with the awfully common trend in the series of characters changing their hairstyle in response to the big changes in their lives. But hey, that's just a nitpick. The point is, Aragi is clearly different post Ogi Dark. He is still the same person and still acts the same, but the reasons for his actions are different. No longer does he feel the need to punish himself and no longer does he feel the need to make himself seem important. He has great friends, a girlfriend who loves him, a partner for all eternity and his living shadow who he can consult at any time. And to think, this is the guy who in Kizuma the Godfrey said he didn't need friends as they lowered his intensity as a human. As the thing that gave him strength, the thing that allowed him to change and become a better person by understanding his own flaws and gaining a sense of self-perspective was friendship and connection. After the main story, Aragi goes on to become a police officer like his parents, and that is because he still has a righteous heart. But the police officer isn't a hero, they help people and see it through to the end, and so Aragi does so as well. He becomes more a hero as a civil servant than he ever did throwing himself in the way of oddities. As he has grown and matured, he has become a true man by the end of the story, one who understands himself and is proud of who he is and the people that care for him and love him. Aragi Kaomi, in conception, is a deconstruction of the typical harem protagonist, the kinds of characters who have no redeeming qualities but still have women flock to them. But for every member of the Aragi harem, we can understand why they were drawn to him and we can see the redeeming qualities underneath his flawed exterior. Throughout this video, you may have got the impression Aragi isn't actually a great person and truthfully, while writing the script, I kind of thought so too. But that just isn't the case. He may be flawed, but he is still a good guy. He never saved those girls, but by getting involved in their lives, he most definitely did help them find the way to saving themselves all on their own. We can all learn from Aragi, from his flaws and how he both incorrectly and then later on correctly addressed them. He in a way is a cautionary tale of what self-obsession, a hero complex and obsecution can do to a person. But at the same time, he is also an inspiring character who genuinely tries to help people. I hope if you're a Monogatari fan like myself, then you learned at least one thing from this incredible character as I honestly think he is pretty much perfect, a perfectly written character from the greatest story ever told. He may not be my favourite protagonist in fiction, as well a certain wavy haired samurai takes that spot, but he is an easy number two. And I feel so grateful I've been able to experience his journey alongside him through the masterpiece of a story Nisho Ishin has crafted. So thank you Aragi Kaomi, thank you Monogatari, and thank you Nisho Ishin so, so much. <laughs> And of course, thank you all so much for getting me to 2,000 subscribers. It genuinely means the world to me. So I really hope you enjoyed this video as well as my Gintoki character analysis, the other part of this big 2K special. And I cannot wait till we hit 2,001 subs as to me, every single one of you who has pressed that subscribe button means the world to me. If you're interested in my literary endeavours, then why not check out my books Gang, Fluid Justice and People of Fate Volume 1, available at Amazon.com. And if you want to go the extra mile in supporting this channel, then consider pledging to my Patreon, where for as little as £2.75 a month, you can get your name at the end of the video, like Hikari Desu, 7SO, Smokey McBobby and Rinjak9696. So with all that said and done, I've been Seth the Sin, the Deadly Sin of Geek, and I'm signing out. Stay safe, everyone.